All right, tonight, our 10th lesson in our studies in Ephesians. Tonight, we use Paul's second chapter again to do a little bit what we've done the last couple of weeks, and that is head back to some of this foundational material. The last two weeks were really foundations of grace kind of stuff. We didn't title them that, but grace was in there both weeks in the titles and, they, and, and both lessons. I got a response from someone this week that said this was, it was, such, an, it was such a great systematic class last week on the grace of God. Um, and that's by design in this portion of Ephesians because Paul's laying out some real... I hate to use fundamental. I don't think Paul thought that he was being fundamental. I don't think he thought he was building some sort of ABCs. Um, what Paul was saying was pathbreaking. I mean, for us, maybe it's fundamental, but it was big time in Paul's time. And it should be big time to us now. And, and I think it is. I think it's one of the things that, that has brought this group together is that inf infatuation with Jesus and the excitement about the grace of God in operation. And that's Ephesians 2. Um, but this title is going to be a little bit of a curveball because this is not a phrase that appears in this section. However, I think because Paul's a good Jew, Saul of Tarsus is Paul. Saul of Tarsus is from the tribe of Benjamin. He is a Pharisee. I know we don't think of him that way, but he is an admitted Pharisee. Um, by the way, when you think Pharisee, don't think bad guy. That's happened to us because we're looking back on the Gospels and we see Jesus in confrontations with Pharisees. We go, Pharisees are bad guys. Scratch that. Think Pharisee, would have, you would have thought pious Jew, a sect of Jewish, of Judaism in the time of Christ, preceding Christ by a century, and then all the way up to past the fall of the temple. Um, and they were a group of men, uh, lay people, really. They weren't aristocracy. They weren't wealthy. They were just people that were... Um, infatuated with the God of, with Jehovah and, and were dedicated to the interpretation of scripture and held a fairly strict view of the Mosaic law. That's why Jesus, I didn't mean to get into this, but okay, here we are. That's why Jesus actually confronts the Pharisees more than the scribes and the Sadducees because you confront your own. And I don't mean Jesus was a Pharisee, but if you look at the the lifestyle and the teachings of the three major groups of Sadducees, the Pharisees, the essence, Jesus is more Pharisaical in how he views Judaism. And you don't, you, you're more prone to train your own. So Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees are because he's, he's with his people. Some of them so much so that they follow him, like the Nicodemuses of the world, the Joseph Arimatheas of the world, who say, yeah, right on, I'm with you. I, this is the way I see it. Uh, Saul of Tarsus was this, and that Saul becomes Paul who writes two-thirds of our New Testament. And he doesn't, we don't just ditch that because he comes to Christ. It isn't a matter of, oh, I've met Jesus, he's my personal Lord and Savior, a phrase Paul never says, by the way. But I'm going to say it because that's how we think about Christianity. Jesus my personal Lord and Savior. I don't need any of that Judaism stuff anymore. And that's not true. That's not the way that Jesus, that, it's not the way that Paul viewed it, although we do see Paul at odds with some of the formulas of Judaism. And we do see Paul trying to pull his audience uh, into a deeper walk with Christ separate from Judaism as their identity. But with that in mind, he has the Torah as his background, the prophets, the Psalms. When Paul tells Timothy late in life, study the scriptures to show yourself approved. Study the scriptures for in them you have salvation through Jesus Christ. He doesn't mean study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those don't exist. He means study your Torah, study your prophets, study the law, study the Psalms. In them you'll find Christ. That's a fascinating thing. So when Paul talks scripture, he's talking Old Testament, and he's talking about things that he would have understood through a Jewish lens. He's reimagining them through a Christian lens. Tonight, we're going to take what would have been a very popular Jewish story. We're going to reimagine it through a Pauline lens, a Christian lens, even if Paul wouldn't have called it Christian. He might have called it a Jesus lens. And in the Jesus lens, we're going to get a transference of character using Paul's text. I title this tonight, The Bridegroom of Blood, a phrase that will appear in the Hebrew. And we're going to go back to the Old Testament before we're finished, and we're going to pick this phrase up because this is, I think, what Paul is working with when he gets into the heartbeat of Ephesians. Now, I want to give you something that you, you, will, you will remember even though we haven't gotten to it yet because you've read Ephesians a hundred times in your life, and that is that Ephesians is on its way to a 
climactic moment of Jesus being the husband and the church being the bride. We're on our way there. We'll get there in chapter 5. That clima- I say that's the climactic moment of Ephesians because the heavenly marriage is what Paul's been working his church up to all the way. I'm presenting you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He, you are the body. You are the bride. And so the, the, we're on our way to the husbandman, Jesus. Um, another word for husband is bridegroom. And uh, the, the groom of the bride, the bride's groom, and that was the way the Hebrews would have said it, is bridegroom. Let's start with our text from Ephesians and let's lay out, this is really going to be a two-parter tonight. The first, half, the first little chunk of this lesson, we're going to try to deal with the text itself. Sort of a one, two, three argument. We're going to use three verses. And then we're going to take a turn and we're going to deal with this title because I, and, and then we're going to bring it back home because I think that Paul has all of this in his head as he's writing this. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh. If I were to just, without having read this entire block, but I really want you to lock in on something as sort of the thing we're going to do for 10 minutes, it's once Gentiles. That would be the underlying moment right now. That'd be your highlight moment. And I want you to just keep in mind that Paul is viewing his audience as having been once Gentiles. Well, what are they now? Okay, Paul doesn't go along in a couple verses and go, now you're Christians. He also doesn't come along in a couple verses and go, now you're Jews. So what are you? He doesn't say you're now Gentiles. He says you're once Gentiles. So I want you to keep that in mind because that's important for, the, for Paul's understanding of what it means to be in Christ. You were once Gentiles in the flesh, literally in your natural bodies you were Gentiles. You were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. The New King James is infatuated with making words into proper nouns um, that aren't. And so uncircumcision and circumcision both get a capital U, capital C. Okay, Um, that's, I just want you to know that's not in Greek. It's not as if Paul puts the definite article in front of it to call them the circumcision as in your name, but it works for purposes of understanding categorization. So you were Gentiles in your flesh, but you were called this. This is like your team name. And so you're the uncircumcised, you're the circumcised. And anyone reading this that's Jewish immediately knows the two camps. Jews are circumcised, Gentiles are not circumcised. Okay, but notice who's doing the calling. You were called uncircumcision by those that are called circumcision. So it's not as if God called you that. It's the other side called you that. The circumcised camp calls you the uncircumcised. So Paul's in in a way sort of pitching these two apart to say you were once Gentiles in your flesh. That side that's called the circumcision, this is what they call you. But notice that their circumcision is also in the flesh. Here's in the flesh. And then in line three, in the flesh. So you were Gentiles in your flesh. They were circumcised in their flesh that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Famous statement by Paul. Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Um, You are not citizens of Israel. You are non-Israelite. You are everything else. Israel would have looked, and by the way, there was no national Israel. Okay. There was no country on the planet in Paul's day called Israel. There was a group of people who called themselves Israelites. They were dispersed all over the Roman Empire. The largest concentration of them were near Jerusalem, near the temple. But the the diaspora was separated across the globe of their day, all across the Mediterranean. Uh, Israel is not a nation. It's not a place on the map in Paul's day. It's an identity. That sounds like a throw-in line. It's not. It's very important for tonight. It's an identity. You were aliens from that identity and you were strangers from the covenants of promise. You didn't have a covenant. So equate this. If you're a Gentile, you're uncircumcised, you're an alien, you're a stranger, you don't have a covenant. That's your highlights of that moment. Uncircumcised, don't have a covenant, aliens, uh, Gentiles. You had no hope. You were without God in the world. Transverse. Flip it. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, you who once were far off, put a big old arrow right back up to here. How far off were you? 
Gentiles in the flesh, uncircumcised, aliens from the commonwealth of the strangers, but that's how far off you were. You didn't have an identity. You didn't have a people. You didn't have a covenant. You don't have a, you don't even have, you don't have physical markings of belonging to anything. You're a bunch of vagabonds from all over the place. He goes, but you who were far off have been brought near by, and here's Paul's hammer. What did it? His blood. And I'm just kind of easing us into this, these verses because sometimes it's just easy to miss what's happening. This whole passage is bleeding. Circum- the minute you write in the word circumcision, it's blood. Because circumcision is a bloody event. It is a bloody event that the bloodshed links that baby to his father and his father's father and his father's father. And it runs him all the way to Abraham. That's the whole reason for circumcision is to link covenantally generations all the way back to the original circumcised one, Abraham. So the blood is the link in circumcision. Paul goes, you don't have that. You're Gentiles, you're aliens, you're strangers, you don't have God, you don't have hope, you don't have a country, you don't have a people, you don't have a name, you're not even circumcised. But you've been brought near by another shedding of blood. And it's at the end, it's Paul bringing Christ's blood. He's elevating Christ's blood beyond circumcision, national Israel, covenants of promise. Christ becomes the centerpiece because this is Paul's great gift. Say what you will about Paul. He can be a little wishy-washy. He can get his feelings hurt rather easy in his text. He loves to teach his own context sometimes into his writings. But my man's obsessed with Jesus. I mean, when you read the writings of Paul, he centerpieces Jesus repeatedly over and over and over. You think he's going to run off in one area and he will bring it back. No one says Christ more in the New Testament than Paul, the anointed one. No one is more impressed with resurrected Jesus than Paul. Paul's great argument against the other apostles is that is they spend too much time talking about the Jesus they knew. And Paul's like, the Jesus you knew don't matter. The Jesus that is matters. The risen Christ, the resurrected one. Stop telling me stories about what Jesus did. I want to tell you who Christ is. It's Paul that frames Christianity around Christ is in us. He's the hope of glory. It's not a historical figure. He's a present reality. He keeps landing there, grounding everything in that over and over and over again. Now, I told you to really remember this. You were once Gentiles. Let me show you what I mean. Here's, here's another argument Paul makes to the Galatian church. Chapter 3, verse 28, 29. I'm going to just throw in three verses real quick to really kind of solidify this before we take off on this tonight. There's neither, this is Paul, to me, this is Paul's sweet song of Christianity. This is when Paul's singing the music the best. Because the very best in the world sometimes have a great moment and they sometimes have a terrible moment, you know? Um, I've preached this before and compared this to, say, Thomas Jefferson's, we hold these truths to be self-evident, you know, the 35 greatest words in American history, all men are created equal. That's his moment when he really sings the American song. And then he goes back to Monticello and beats his 200 slaves half to death. You go, whoa, how can you, how can that truth be self-evident and that exist at the same time? Well, flawed humanity is how. Paul doesn't always sing this song this well. Sometimes his, his, I don't, sometimes it doesn't, it's a little out of tune. But on this one, he nails this note. This is perfect pitch. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Doesn't get any better than that. No religious separation. No financial, economic, social ladder separation. Not even a gender separation. No hierarchy. Old hierarchies are gone. Every one of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you belong to Abraham's seed and your heirs according to the promise. This is the kind of stuff that gets Paul in trouble with his own people because neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male nor female, everybody's in Christ. And if you're in Christ, then you are actually Abraham's seed. Look at that. You are. Not tribe of Ephraim, not tribe of Manasseh, not tribe of Judah. Those that are in Christ are actually Abraham's seed and they get the promise. Remember what he said in Ephesians to the Gentiles? You didn't have a covenant of promise. Then you came to Christ. Now what do you have? Not only do you have a promise, you're an heir. Oh, you didn't even circumcise yourself? That's okay. Blood of Christ did that for you. Somebody already bled on your behalf. Paul closes the Galatian letter with this thought, Galatians 6.16. As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And Paul's the only person in the New Testament that makes this phrase, the Israel of God. Because Paul has just coined a phrase in the New Testament. The Israel of God are the inheritors of the promise 
from Galatians chapter 3. So Israel's not a country, and it's not a people made up of circumcised people. It's a people made up of those in Christ for Paul. So Paul proclaims Israel, not, not new Israel. Paul proclaims not a replacement for Israel, but for those that are in Christ to be true Israel. You could say it this way. Jesus doesn't come along and, make, and, and wed the church as a replacement to Israel. Jesus comes along as the fulfillment of Israel's promise. And then everyone that comes in under Jesus is that promise. And that, that's why we say to you repeatedly, you can't get anything outside of Jesus because only in Christ are the promises fulfilled. And so when you come into Christ, you come into the covenant of promise, only there do you find fulfillment. All right, here's Paul's breakdown, or at least the way I see it. Remember you were Gentiles, uncircumcised, circumcised, without Christ, aliens, in Christ. You've been brought near by what? Blood of Christ. Here's how Paul argues it. Verse 11, and I just want to do, I just want to do one, two, three. Verse 11, circumcision was an act of the flesh by hands. Keep that in mind. Circumcision was not some super spiritual, invisible thing. It was an actual fleshly act that happened on a baby boy at eight days old. Jesus, an observant Jew, son of observant Jews, was circumcised at eight days old. His mom and dad brought him into the temple and they circumcised him and they were obviously poor because they brought two turtle doves. And the Levitical law said that if you were wealthy, you could bring a bull. And if you were a little less wealthy, you brought a goat and on down the line to a lamb. If you didn't have much at all, you could bring two pigeons or two turtle doves. And that's what his family brings when they bring Jesus to be circumcised on the eighth day. It's an act of the flesh by hands, but it meant something in a Jewish world. It connected Jesus to that natural family on the earth. Paul proceeds the argument to verse 12. The Gentiles were viewed as uncircumcised, but Paul says, you're not just uncircumcised, you're actually without Christ outside the covenant of promise, which is an interesting statement because no Jew in Paul's day that was circumcised thought their circumcision had anything to do with Christ. And so Paul goes, they called you uncircumcised, but your problem was not circumcision in the flesh. Your problem is you were without Christ. Now, I hope you can see where Paul's going with this. By the time he gets to Galatians, he rounds that argument out by going, oh, by the way, just because you're circumcised, you still need to get in Christ. So Paul's, Paul's expanded the borders of what it means to be Israel, but he's changing the rules. So it's not just natural circumcision that gets you in. It's going to be Christ that gets you in. And when you get in Christ, you actually get in the covenant of promise. And then verse 13 fulfills his argument. Christ's blood, the cutting of Christ, or let's just say it Paul's way, the circumcision, not his eight day circumcision, his actual shedding of his blood at Calvary is good enough. Note that Paul connects Christ's blood to circumcision and Christ's blood to covenant. And this is to me a fun fact and one worth your own personal investigation, especially considering you and I did John and we did the seven churches of Revelation and we did first John because so we did a lot of John. This is our first Paul book, which is incredible to me. Us walking through Ephesians. Paul's language of the blood is redemption. John's language of the blood is washing and cleansing. John's the one that says we have been cleansed from our sins by the blood. Revelation chapter 1, Jesus, John sees Jesus and Jesus says those who are washed in the blood. Paul doesn't use the language, you've been washed in Jesus' blood. You've been cleansed by Jesus' blood. I'm not saying it's wrong because Paul didn't use it. I'm saying Paul doesn't think of the blood the way John thinks of the blood. John thinks of the blood as a cleansing thing that washes you off of what's wrong with you. Paul thinks of the blood as a replacement to circumcision. Jesus was cut. Why would you need to be cut? The blood's been shed. How many times do you get circumcised? This is Paul's argument. How many times does a boy get circumcised? Once. How many times Jesus die? Paul will make this argument in Romans 6. How many times does Jesus die? Once. How many times do you die? Once. Why are you dying over and over again? Why, are you, why do you feel as if there is something that you need to do to be more saved, more redeemed, more anointed, closer? So Paul brings the whole argument back to that very core Jewish rite of circumcision and then just replaces it. He just sort of wipes the board of it. 
It's like writing it across the board, and then just erases it and sticks blood of Jesus over it and says, okay, the blood of Jesus does that. The blood of Christ becomes not just your washing, your cleansing. The blood of Christ becomes your purchase price. His blood for you. His blood doing for you what circumcision was supposed to do for you. And he goes, but that's too limited. And besides, it's only flesh. I want you to have a different kind of cutting. Not just a body cut, a, a heart cut. And that was actually God's promise from the Old Testament that I'm, I'm going to eventually circumcise the heart. Let's go all the way back to the core of this thing. All right, Genesis 17. Here's where it all starts. You might not be that interested in this. It's worth writing down. You need to know it. You might not need it memorized, but it'd be nice to know where to find it. How did this whole thing get started with circumcision? Because by the way, Judaism is the only major religion of the world, in the history of the world, that made circumcision a right, R-I-T-E, of their religion. But what is it about that right? God is talking in Genesis 17. This is my covenant. And he's talking to Abraham, by the way. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house, or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. So anybody in the house. It doesn't have to be blood. It has to be anybody that receives their sustenance under your roof because there's something very powerful of the roof in, Christ, in he, uh, Judaism. What's inside the house is safe. When I see the blood, remember this from Exodus? When I see the blood, I will pass over. I won't just pass over the dad and the daughter and sneak in there and kill the mom. When I see the blood, I will pass over all of you. Have you ever considered that not everybody in that house was full of faith? In fact, some people in that house were probably scared to death, looking out the window, hiding under the table. But it wasn't confidence that makes it work. It's the blood. This is why your Christianity might kind of feel like this. I'm really excited for, to be a, a Christian today and live for Jesus. And then it, it goes, oh, I don't know about all this business. I'm, I'm kind of down and depressed. But it wasn't the attitude in the house. It was in the house. So when I see the blood, I'll pass over. So this is God's way. Whatever's in the house, that's protected. That's Paul's seventh chapter, 1 Corinthians. Remember when Paul goes, hey, believers, believing husbands, if you're married to an unbelieving wife and she's satisfied living in your house, stay with her. You make her holy. Hey, ladies. If you're a believer and your husband's an unbeliever, don't leave him. Just being married to you makes him holy. I've never heard that preached in the, in the church in my life. <laughs> By the way, that's not an obscure passage in the Old Testament. That's the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians. That's Paul, the minister of grace, going, hey, what you have is so powerful, people near you are safe. Wow. What, why does he say that? Because he's a good Jew. I, I mean it. He says it because he's a good Jew. And in Jewish theology, if you're in the house and the blood's on the house, you're good. So Paul goes, try to get a bunch of people in your house. Like, almost literally. Like, just try to make sure that, you, that this is that whole your faith is powerful for somebody else. That's the four friends that lower their friend in. I just did this essay today from Mark 2. The four friends that lower their friend in front of Jesus and Mark, and the Bible says Jesus looks at them and sees their faith. He doesn't look at the paralytic man. I kind of wonder if the paralytic man was arguing with his friends outside going, don't do this. This is stupid. He can't heal me. Don't drag me. What do you mean you're going to take me down through the roof? No, take me home. This is dumb. And Jesus ignores him and looks at his friend's faith because sometimes you need your friend because they believe where you don't. And so it's that connection to something bigger than you. And so this, that's where this surfaces. Anybody in your house needs to be circumcised. He was born in your house. He's bought with your money. must be circumcised. All my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. The uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Well, this is big. That person shall be cut off from this people. He has broken my covenant. So God seems pretty literal to Abraham. He goes, look. If they are not, and, and I know there's a, there's a Hebrew play on words here. Any man who is not circumcised would be any man who has not been cut off 
will be cut off. So any man who's not been cut off by circumcision will be cut off from the covenant. The covenant is protection. The covenant is the blessing. So God goes, I don't know, they're, they're on their own. They don't want to, they don't want to come in through this rite, this ceremony. They're on their own. Let me read for you Robert Alter. I, I, I love Robert Alter's Hebrew translation of the Bible. Um, I, I want to read to you his statement on circumcision. Circumcision is the mark of belonging to the covenantal community, as God announced to Abraham when he enjoined the practice. We just read that, by the way, Genesis 17. So circumcision is a prerequisite to participation in the community-defining Passover ritual. You couldn't take a Passover meal if you weren't circumcised. Taking a Passover meal was the right of, of Judaism. There is a symbolic overlap between the apotropaic blood of circumcision, the apotropaic blood of the lamb on the doorpost, and God saving Israel from the bloodbath of Egypt to make them his people. I almost dropped the word apotropaic because who's used that one in a sentence? <laughs> but I thought, well, if you're going to quote Robert Alter, then quote Robert Alter. And apotropaic is a word, just a big fancy word for breaking a curse or something believed to be bad luck. So Alter's actually saying that in his theory, they were really, the, the blood was believed, the circumcision blood and the blood of the lamb on the doorpost was being used to break a bad luck curse. Like circumcision was looked at to break a bad luck curse. Blood over the door was looked at to break a bad luck curse. He drops atropopaic when he says God saves Israel from the bloodbath of Egypt to make him his people because that had nothing to do with bad luck. But notice the, there's a, I like his phrase, there's a symbolic overlap because the blood of circumcision, the blood of the lamb in Egypt, the blood of the Egyptians that God sheds to make them his people. What's all that have to do with this? All right, this is where, this is where to me this gets fun. There is a story in the Old Testament. I, I just asked you how many times you heard somebody preach 1 Corinthians 7. Um, if you are a believer and your spouse is not, don't leave them. They're holy because of you. And Pretty much all of your heads nodded in the negative. I've never heard that sermon. Uh, um, that doesn't mean it hasn't been preached or taught, but it's just not common. It's not one of the things we think about. Let me go show you another one from the Old Testament that hardly ever gets talked about because it's so bizarre that it exists. All right, to do this, I want you to open your mind to something. I want you to open your mind to the possibility that as the Bible is being compiled... It is being compiled by men who are trying to make sense of the stories they've heard that's been passed down to them from generation to generation, and they are undoubtedly borrowing elements of stories that may or may not be from their own tradition. Like, for instance, Genesis has Noah's Ark. But the ark, the flood story exists in almost every piece of literature that predates the Bible. Almost exactly the way it shows up in Genesis. Um, the Mesopotamian flood story happens like almost a thousand years before the Hebrews ever write it down of happening to Noah. So there could be some borrowing going on to say, here's how we explain what we believe happened. Um, in the middle of that, there are times when the narrative is flowing really nicely. And then it hits a wall and something gets dropped in that doesn't hardly make any sense contextually. And then the narrative picks back up. That happens in the Jacob story. Uh, remember when um, Judah rapes his sister Tamar? That thing's out of left field. If you're reading the narrative of Genesis, I mean, we're, we're rushing along and then beep, full stop. Here comes this story, bizarre story that's not even in the timeline, by the way. If you look at how old they are, it's not even in the timeline. It's like at a different moment in time and it gets dropped in the middle of the story. And you come back to the story and go, what in the world happened there? And scholars love this stuff because they love to try to figure out why it exists. I'm going to show you one and I'm going to read into it with a text that seems pretty familiar from Exodus chapter 4 verse 18. Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they're still alive. 
And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. This happens because Moses has been on the backside of the desert for 40 years. Remember, he sees the fire, the bush is burned, but it's not consumed, puts his hand in his cloak, comes out as leprosy, puts it back in his cloak, comes out clean. God goes, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses goes to his father-in-law, his Gentile father-in-law. He's married that guy's daughter, his Gentile daughter. He's had kids with a Gentile daughter. So he's got a bunch of Gentiles running around. And he goes back to his Gentile father-in-law and he goes, let me go back to Egypt. God sent me on a mission He says, go in peace. The Lord said to Moses and Midian, go return to Egypt. All the men who sought your life are dead. Why? Because the last thing Moses does before he leaves Egypt is he kills an Egyptian, buries his body in the sand, and then thinks, okay, everything's cool. Only a week or so, or maybe the next day, someone says, are you going to kill us like you killed that other guy? And Moses freaks out like you would. And he hits the road. And that's what puts him on the backside of the desert. So God says, don't worry. All the men who knew what you did are dead. And since they're dead, I'm the only one that knows what you did. Go on back. Moses took his wife, his sons, and set them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. All right, all is well. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all the wonders before Pharaoh which I put in your hand, and I, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Is this story familiar? Should be, unless you don't read your Bible, and then shame on you. <laughs> then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Here's God being a dad. 23, so I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Now get ready. It came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Time out, full stop. (laughs) God told him to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses goes, I can do that. I'll go ask my father-in-law if we can leave. He asks his father-in-law. His father-in-law says, here, take your kids, your wife, go your way. And Moses takes his rod in his hand, his symbol of authority, and he's heading back to Pharaoh to do exactly what God tells him. And he gets to the encampment. And this word in the Hebrew is he gets to the dark place. He gets to the darkest night because you got to go through the dark night of your soul if you're ever going to do anything big. So you don't ever just get to go waltzing into the next step of your life. You usually go through hell. And when you get there, you meet something that's ready to kill you. And in the Hebrew vernacular, it's the Lord. It's big old capital L-O-R-D. It's the covenant God. The same God that just told him to go to Egypt Meets him on his way to scholars who've been messed up for years as to why verse 24 drops in here all of a sudden. This is three weird verses in the middle of a narrative that straight up doesn't need them. Because if you drop 24, 25, 26, I know I haven't read 25, 26 yet. If you drop them from the story, the story works. Moses just goes back. But let's don't drop them because they're there. And I think Paul knows them really well when he writes to the church at Ephesus. 25. Zipporah. This is his Gentile wife. Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. The Hebrew uses the phrase, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him go. God let Moses go because God was going to kill Moses, according to verse 24. Then she said, you are a bridegroom of blood. And the narrator throws in because of the circumcision. And in the next verse, they go on their way like this never happened. What in the world is going on in this story? I don't know for sure where Paul is landing on how much he knows this versus, I'm not saying that right, how much he wants this to be a part of his Ephesians narrative and how much I see it as part. So I'm not going to accuse that Paul. This Paul sees that Paul linking a story he would have known very well because he knows his Torah and trying to make sense of a story that probably baffled him. Why would God do this? And Paul's not alone because it's what Hebrew commentators have been doing forever. Most Hebrew commentators say Moses was being judged for failing to circumcise his sons, but I'm not sure I agree with that. Zipporah knows nothing about circumcision. And then she does, and when she finds out about it, she's not happy. She circumcises their child, throws the foreskin at Moses' feet. Other commentators see a Gentile bride shedding blood to appease God. 
maybe closer. Here's God about to kill Moses. And Zipporah circumcises their baby and throws the foreskin at Moses' feet and goes, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. This is what you brought me to. And the moment she throws it at Moses' feet, God backs off and goes, all right, let's go. And so if you're a commentator, you're a, you're a scholar trying to figure this out, where might you land? I think the story might have been inserted to show that Moses needed redeemed for his murder of an Egyptian. Blood for blood. That's man's mentality of what happens when you kill. Blood for blood. In fact, it's the Genesis mentality of what happens when you kill. Because it's what God said in the book of Genesis. That if you take life, your life is taken. And it would almost seem to me that years later, the scholars are reading the Moses story and need a moment of redemption for Moses. They need Moses to pay for murdering an Egyptian. And how is he going to pay for murdering an Egyptian? Surely the payment is not God going, oh, well, everybody wanted to kill you is dead. We can just ignore the fact that you killed someone. And the story of the circumcision is inserted. And in any case, however we should interpret it, the Hebrew people from that moment forward have a story to connect circumcision to redemptive blood. However you interpret this story, these three verses are in your Bible. (laughs) And why that's important is because the Hebrews had a story in which someone needed redeemed from taking another man's life. And the redemption Moses received was the circumcision of his son and the circumcision or the bleeding of his son appeased God. And that's in the Hebrew mindset. I hope you can see that before this story, circumcision just connects you to the covenant. Circumcision means you're part of the covenant. But when this story surfaces, circumcision connects you to redemption. Redemption is to be purchased out of something. It's to be bought out of something. It's to be in one thing, released, and put in another thing. So... I think Paul takes the idea of redemptive circumcision. Where would he have gotten redemptive circumcision? Maybe Exodus 4. Maybe he just got it in revelation from God. God said, this is, this is a new way to preach circumcision. But in any way that he gets it, here's what he does with it. In Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Where's he heading? This is Ephesians 2. He's on his way to Ephesians 5. And in Ephesians 5, Jesus is a husband. And the church is his bride. And Paul just put the blood of Jesus as the way to actually be circumcised. He makes Christ's circumcision your redemption. Because I think he saw circumcision as Moses' redemption. Or at least that was an interpretation he could take from his own people's stories. And no one else does anything with it but Paul. Paul takes circumcision and goes, I think that that's all of us. We are in the dark night of our soul. We are in the place of death. We are in the place of being judged for the blood that we've shed. And the only thing that's going to save us is circumcision. And he goes, but we have a bridegroom of blood. We have a husband who bled on our behalf. And our bridegroom of blood has redeemed us from the curse of sin. He has made us His own. To the Colossians, this is our final spot. To the Colossians, he says it this way. Chapter 2, verse 11. In Christ you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That's the exact different circumcision. That's the opposite circumcision as Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, by hands. Colossians 2, without hands. Be a natural Jew, circumcised in the flesh. In Christ, not in the flesh. We put off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Does Paul mean that the body of the sins of our flesh were put off when eight-day-old Jesus was circumcised in the temple? That wouldn't make much sense. So let's try it again. In Christ, you were circumcised when He was cut off. When Christ was cut off, You were circumcised, buried with Him in your baptism, raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. Paul's message of salvation then is, Christ received a brand new circumcision. Jesus was cut off at Calvary. 
the cutting of Jesus, bloodshed, buys all of you who deserve to die, buys all of you who are in the dark, buys all of you who have shed innocent blood, all of us. John likes you're washed in the blood, you're cleansed by the blood. Paul likes you've been purchased by the blood. Stop shedding your own. And this is why Paul goes on a rampage in Galatians against circumcision. And it's why in Philippians, listen to this one. I didn't, I didn't give you this, but this is why in Philippians 3, 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. The word mutilation is circum, it's, it's those who circumcise you. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. We are the circumcision. If you can get Philippians 3, 2, and 3. You got verse 3? Coming up. I don't know why I didn't give you this. Beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers. We are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we don't have any confidence in our flesh. So Paul goes, forget this telling me who your daddy is. Forget telling me how you were raised, where you were raised, your heritage. Because we don't have any confidence in the flesh. Those days are over with. We are the circumcision, he goes, who are in Christ. Christ. Paul does it again. Paul's got theology, and then he just, he always slides Christ in there. So he takes Christ from wherever he is, and he puts him in. He's, Christ becomes the centerpiece of every one of Paul's messages. I think Jesus has become our bridegroom of blood. Jesus is the one who bleeds on behalf of his church. Jesus is the one who is cut off so that we go free. So that all of us, now don't get lost. If you're getting lost in Exodus 4 going, why is God going to kill Moses? Is God the bad guy in this story? And remember that the stories are inserted to understand God through the lens of man. And Paul would have done the same thing in looking at the stories of God to understand God through the lens of man. And I think that's what he's doing when he lays this out in Ephesians as well. Let's pray. This is one of those that just needs to take some time and soak into your soul a little bit. Father, you are good, and I thank you for your goodness and your grace, and I thank you for my friends here and around the world who listened and who will listen to this word and who will apply it to their lives in this, I think, this simple way, and that is seeing Jesus as the one who's been cut. His blood, not my blood. His effort, not my effort. In His cutting, I'm part of the family. In His circumcision of the heart, I'm part of the seed of Abraham. I belong to the family not because of where I was born or where I go to church or who my parents were or how much money we have or what era of humanity I happened to take my first breath in. I am part of this because of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that these are the sermons and the lessons that hopefully help build our faith. May that be what happens Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. As we hear of Jesus, may our faith explode. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.